Despite my research and preparations, at the end of a busy second day out exploring the Galapagos on my Silver Origin cruise, it dawned on me that there were five things I could see that I had not fully appreciated before coming. Welcome aboard. I'm Gary Bembridge. Join me to discover what a Galapagos cruise is really like and why I found out that maybe for many people it shouldn't actually be on their bucket list. The first surprise I had once there was about the landscape of the Galapagos. While I found the Galapagos landscape unique, I had wrongly, from the videos and shows that I'd watched, expected it to be impressive by its constant majesty, as I had on my other expedition cruises to the Arctic and to Antarctica. Now, while there were some memorable parts, like walking on the unworldly lava field at Sullivan Bay, Santiago, and an unexpected beach at Cerro Berugio on San Cristobal, Overall, it lacked the splendor and the wow of other expedition regions. What was more interesting, though, was the whole story of the landscapes and how they're rough and harsh from their volcanic creation. Secondly, as a more casual nature and wildlife fan, early on, I thought the, the wildlife kind of lacked a wow factor. There were no bucket list massive big beasts like you, the big five you see on an African safari, polar bears and walruses in the Arctic, the big sprawling penguin colonies and pods of whales in Antarctica. But through the week, I came to appreciate this is what makes it unique. There are no large land mammals because the wildlife on the Galapagos had to find their way there. The islands are a thousand kilometers off the coast of Ecuador. And so wildlife originally flew there or are believed to have drifted across the ocean stuck on floating vegetation. I saw five key wildlife groups that I came to appreciate. The highlight for me were the giant tortoises, probably what the islands are best known for. The many inquisitive Galapagos sea lions are pretty much every place we visited. Lazy iguanas, marine iguanas, Galapagos land iguana lying about sunning themselves. Frisky Galapagos penguins in the western Ferdanina and Isabella Islands due to the cold currents that are there. I came to appreciate the birds too, including red-footed boobies, blue-footed boobies, NASCAR boobies, giant frigate birds, Darwin finches, and brown pelicans. Though a big revelation was the variety of marine life I saw snorkeling, like some of the apparently over 500 species of fish, rays, sharks, and turtles. It was on my first hike at Darwin Bay on Genovisa that one of the best parts of wildlife viewing in the Galapagos revealed itself. They are not bothered by humans at all. I could walk right by and up to the iguanas, birds, and sea lions so close, I never once needed to use the zoom lens I packed and had to use on every other expedition, cruise, and safari that I've been on. Over the course of the week, I estimate 95% of guests ended up using their iPhone to take photos as they could get that close. I did use this, my small Sony RX100, which has a good zoom, only so I could get tight, close-up detail of wildlife, like this iguana and this baby bird chick to use in my videos. But just as easily, I use my iPhone to get these close-ups of baby sea lions. During my week, I realized that while Galapagos is probably more of a destination for true nature lovers, like my nephews who adore birds, reptiles, and fish, a more casual lover like me can be thrilled by getting up so close. The brochures made it sound like this would be pretty much like every other expedition trip that I've been on. And as I was going with the same company, Silver Sea, I definitely thought it would be. However, there were again five things that I found were very different and unique to a Galapagos one. 100% of the crew on all Galapagos ships must be Ecuadorian nationals. There is no foreign crew at any level as on other expedition cruises I've been on. In fact, the expedition team were all Galapagos residents as to be a licensed guide in the Galapagos National Park, they had to be. The cuisine was mostly regional dishes using locally sourced ingredients. It was a fuller, more demanding and tiring schedule than any expedition cruise that I've been on to date. I had three active activities off the ship per day with early starts of 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. for the first one. Every day, 
there were hikes with dry or wet landing off the zodiac. A wet landing is where you have to step off the zodiac into the water, like for example I did at Darwin Bay. Most of the hikes were called adventurous, like at Prince Philip Steps on Genovisa, where we had to climb up and then down 30 steep rocky steps to go sightseeing, or at North Seymour, clambering over rocks uh, along the path. A few are easy, like that relaxed walk along the sandy beach at Cerro Barujo Beach in San Cristobal I mentioned earlier on. Another key daily activity was snorkeling. I quickly realized after day one that anyone that didn't go snorkeling missed out on a significant chunk of what there is to see here. Some of my most memorable and remarkable outings were snorkeling. On some I had a sea lion scooting around me, groups of turtles wafting by, beautiful fish all around, rays, and even sharks. Another important but less frequent activity was heading away from the coast into the highlands. This is where the giant tortoises are. We did this twice. Once on Santa Cruz Island's Montima Tortoise Reserve, which is on the tortoise migration path. Here I saw dozens of tortoises everywhere. The other was to San Cristobal's Tortoise Breeding Center, where I got to see both adult tortoises and the baby tortoises that they're rearing to release into the wild. The final activity were zodiac rides in places where we were not allowed to land. We did one at Punta Mangal on Ferdinand Island and at the nearby Punta Moreno on Isabella Island. Here we got really close to Gal Galapagos penguins seeking food with pelicans diving into the sea all around fishing for theirs. So this is how the day went. Two activities in the morning, lunch as the ship moved to a new location, an afternoon activity, a short break before the 6.45 p.m. lecture and 7.15 p.m. briefing for the next day, then dinner and bed ready for the next early start. Now I consider myself fit and I did the number of daily and active expeditions, early starts, and it's a really packed schedule. It was really rather tiring. By the way, there was no entertainment as such other than a pianist who played during drinks before the talk, after dinner and at lunch. There was one cooking class and one trivia on the last evening. Based on all of this, I also realized the Galapagos is even less suitable for mobility restricted or less active travelers than any other expedition cruise that I've been on. Everything requires climbing in and out of zodiacs, sometimes with a swell. The ship never docks, so even to embark and disembark requires going on a zodiac. As I mentioned, the hikes were mostly over rocks or steps to get to see the best wildlife and going snorkeling is key. It doesn't seem that many boats or ships, by the way, have accessible cabins either. It felt to me that the Galapagos has more rules than any other expedition area that I've ever been to. The Galapagos National Park established in 1959 governs and polices the area. They have a set number of sites that ships can go to and they schedule who can go where and when to limit numbers at any site per day. It seems there are about 90 approved sites and around 80 to 90 licenses for boats to operate. Most of those, by the way, are small with 40 passengers or even fewer uh, up to a few ships like Silver Origin I was on with the maximum allowed, which is 100. Before we arrived in the Galapagos, my luggage had to be bio-searched. I handed my luggage over the night before at the Quito Priestay Hotel to be searched and sealed. I wasn't allowed to break that seal until I got my bags on the ship. During the flight from Quito to the islands, the plane was sprayed with insect spray. The Galapagos has a huge problem with invasive species wreaking havoc. In the onboard talks, I learned there is up to 1,700 animals, insects, or plants that have arrived on the island either by accident or design with terrible consequences. For example, goats spoke by man multiplied to tens of thousands, destroying the vegetation the tortoises relied on. They culled something like 60,000 of them. Blackberries and raspberries spread like wildfire, breaking down the ecosystem, blocking the migration of tortoises. Rats have affected the bird life, eating the eggs. Bugs, foreign bugs burrowing into young chicks and wiping out flocks. Once there, I found other rules to protect the overall ecosystem and the wildlife. For example, 
we had to use eco suitable sunscreen, especially if snorkeling. Now I didn't actually take any because I knew that Silver Sea supplied the right kind of stuff on board. We had mandatory briefings on the first night before we could go on land, learning rules like having to stay on laid out pathways. I couldn't even take a step off them to take a photo, for example. Bags were random search leaving the island, including mine, to check nothing natural had been taken like feathers, stones, flora, or baby tortoises, I guess, too. Let me talk about Silver Sea's Silver Origin, as it is the smallest cruise ship I've ever been on, holding just 100 passengers. I had a real concern it would feel cramped with few options, but as I've said, there was little time to do much on board. While it did have limited facilities, it never felt small, and I never felt lacking a facility. There was the spacious Explorer's Lounge for the briefings and the drinks, the restaurant, which could seat everyone at one time, the grill, a casual lunch dining and Silver Sea Signature Hot Rocks outdoor restaurant, a small fitness center, a hardly used observation lounge, the base camp with guest services and an interactive information screen, and the marina for getting on and off Zodiacs. My cabin, which was a deluxe veranda suite, was way bigger than I'd expected. Lots of space, a big walk-in cupboard, a good-sized bathroom, comfortable bed. The reason it was bigger is because it had one of those infinity balconies with a sliding glass top window. While the Galapagos is not about grand majestic scenery nor bucketless big mammals, I came to appreciate it's more about the story of the unique wild bird and marine life and how they survive in this very remote and harsh environment and how close you can get right up to them to experience them. I did come away thinking this is more of a bucket list destination for true nature lovers than the other places for expeditions that I've been on. Now, if you decide to go to the Galapagos, watch this video of tips I really wish I had known before going, starting with one key change I would have made to make the trip better from the start. See you over there.